It's an embarrassment to the country, and it is a stain on this institution. You should be ashamed of yourselves, but you won't be. I still don't understand what point he was trying to make. I thought it was ridiculous. It depends who you're you talking to. You really don't know much about me, do you? Uh, and I don't want to. No. They did their jobs. 18 years later, do yours! What are we looking at here? Where are these cards from? He just got these cards from his friend. And we won't allow it to happen again. What we saw down there, no human should ever have to see. More of these men and women are going to get sick and they are going to die. Ray, are we ever going to find my dad? This is what this kid said to me. If we can't take care of them, what chance do the rest of us have? There is not a person here that didn't tweet out, never forget the heroes of 9-11. Well, here they are. Six years later, Ray Pfeiffer was diagnosed with renal cancer. People constantly passing from 9-11 cancer. I mean, we get notifications daily that somebody's passing. Installed in the Senate. An extension of the 9 11 Victim Compensation Fund has been blocked for now. And now families of first responders are fired up. And you can end it tomorrow. John Stewart and The Daily Show at Comedy Central did a great service on their show last night. What, what's, what's going through your mind? as you're watching this process go down. We're, uh, we're disgusted, we're disappointed, and uh, unfortunately, we're hurt. It is my honor to present the key to the city of New York to Ray Pfeiffer. I always say, uh, do the right thing even when nobody's looking. A beloved FDNY hero has lost his battle with cancer. Ray Pfeiffer was one of the thousands of firefighters who worked for months on the toxic piles at Ground Zero. I last spoke to Ray the Sunday night before he passed. And I said, Ray, how you doing, man? And without missing a beat, he goes, I can't complain. Ray, you can complain. No, it's okay. I'm a lucky guy. Make no mistake, Ray Pfeiffer died in the line of duty. But more importantly, Ray Pfeiffer lived in the line of duty. We just passed a horrible milestone, which is uh, over 10,000 cancer cases, 9-11 related. Hundreds died in an instant. Thousands more poured in to continue to fight for their brothers and sisters. The breathing problems started almost immediately, and they were told they weren't sick, they were crazy. And then, as the illnesses got worse and things became more apparent, well, okay, you're sick, but it's not from the pile. And then when the science became irrefutable, okay, it's the pile, but this is a New York issue. I don't know if we have the money. And I am awfully tired of hearing that it's a 9-11 New York issue. They attacked America and these men and women and their response to it is what brought our country back. It's what gave a reeling nation a solid foundation to stand back upon, to remind us of why this country is great, of why this country is worth fighting for. 
and you are ignoring them. Ray would say, calm down, Johnny, calm down. I got all the cards I need. And he would tap his pocket. Where he kept the prayer cards. 343 firefighters. Your indifference cost these men and women their most valuable commodity. Time. It's the one thing they're running out of. More of these men and women are going to get sick and they are going to die. And you can end it tomorrow. They responded in five seconds. They did their jobs. Courage, grace, tenacity, humility. 18 years later, do yours. I was declared dead for three days. When the South Tower came down, I was right underneath it, and I realized I had about seven seconds left to live. Slightly more than 12 years ago, on September 11, 2001, it was a day that it seemed the world stood still for a full day in all 198 countries of Earth. An incredible plane crash into the World Trade Center. We have serious news of a major possible air crash in the United States. And I was in the middle of it in New York City. My firehouse was right across the street where I began my career in 1980. I was under the second jet. It came right over my head when United Airlines Flight 175 struck the South Tower 17 minutes after the North Tower. I was declared dead for three days. When the South Tower came down, I was right underneath it and I realized I had about seven seconds left to live. And all I was afraid of was that my body would never be found or identified. And I started running, but I never made it. The South Tower came down, all my ribs were broken, my arm was snapped in half, my shoulders were torn off, my back was crushed, and I was bleeding internally. And I'm buried underneath the South Tower with all these other people. They were screaming at the top of their lungs. We couldn't see each other. We were all pinned under steel and concrete, and we were suffocating. And I begged God to take my life. I couldn't live in this pain. And a few minutes later, we were all in the middle of all these fires. And then the screams of those people turned into cries, cries turned into whimpers, and whimpers turned into silence. And one by one, they had all died. I'll never know them. We couldn't see each other, and I was still breathing. And then at that point, People came and they were digging and they found me and they got me on a boat. And on the boat, they were intending to take me across the river to New Jersey to a hospital because I had to get there immediately if they were gonna save me. And then a half hour later, the North Tower fell and it fell on top of the boat and I got buried in the engine room of the boat all alone. And once again, I'm suffocating. I can't breathe and I'm in tremendous pain for almost an hour until they found me again buried in the engine room, and then the boat was taken across the river to a hospital in New Jersey. But nobody thought about looking in hospitals in other states, and that's where I ended up, in New Jersey, a hospital called Jersey City Trauma Center. And for three days, I was declared missing because I was misidentified. You see, boys and girls, this all leads up to the most interesting part of the story. You see, boys and girls, I started my career in the firehouse across the street from the World Trade Center, Engine Company 10. I started my career there in 1980 when that firehouse opened. And I stood there for 16 years until I was promoted to lieutenant on September 5th, 1996. They asked me to work in their Office of Fire Safety Education. And boys and girls, eight months into that assignment, I was named the director of the whole program. And then at that point, I get a call from Fisher-Price Toys. I figured they got a wrong phone number, what do you want? 
This is, we want to run something by you might be interested in. Well, what is it? They wanted a New York City firefighter to be their new rescue hero. And as I was telling them what a firefighter looks like with his bunker gear, his tools, his equipment, his air mask, and they want to have a big press conference in New York City. They want to introduce this new rescue hero. Well, they were so excited. This is, when can we do it? And I'm brainstorming in the meeting. I says, you know, 911 is the emergency phone number in New York City. Why don't we have a 911 day in New York? This was the new rescue hero being introduced on September 11, 2001, at 9 o'clock in the morning when the first jet struck the tower. On my way to the press conference, I saw the tower fully engulfed with flames, and I had to make a big decision. What do I do? Do I go to the press conference for Billy Blazers, which didn't happen anyway, or do I make my way to my old firehouse across the street from the Twin Towers? And that's what I did. Boys and girls, I didn't have to be there that day. I was in a dress uniform. I took my uniform off and borrowed a set of firefighting gear. And in that rescue effort, I was buried. And by the time the sun went down on the evening of September 11, 2001, 344 firefighters were declared dead. Three days later, one was found alive in another state in a hospital, in an operating room, and that was me. And boys and girls, Billy Blazers would come to represent those 343 heroes that I worked with who made the supreme sacrifice of life. Let this day ignite you more than anything could ever ignite you. Billy Blazers, a New York City firefighter rescue hero, is the only rescue hero that represents real people, and that's not me. It was the other 343 firefighters who I get the honor of telling their story. And the marvel of the story, as you're gonna see, life changes. Life takes you down roads you didn't know were meant for you. Life takes you down roads that offer challenges and changes all of us in so many different ways. And that's why, boys and girls, all through life, you gotta be resilient like a palm tree. It's important to keep your eyes open and your hearts open. On September 11th, I was heading to my office. And as I entered that North Tower that morning, I turned to the right and suddenly it felt as if the 110 story tower had imperceptibly jumped. It was punctuated by a loud, piercing, whistling sound. 90 floors above me, the first jet plane had been crashed into the building, cutting through its central core. The jet fuel, which had exploded through the elevator banks, three of which had a direct path to the lobby, came pummeling down. And a moment later, I was enveloped in flames, thousand degree heat, and everything and everyone in its path was in flames as well. The blast had an amazing power and backdraft that continued to pull me into the fire. I was spun around, my voice was powerless, I could not breathe, I could not speak. The pain was unimaginable, the burn's grip was crushing. My hands were so badly burned, they were two mitts at the end of my arms. I realized that this was my moment and my choice. I could keep fighting, or I could surrender, and I decided to live. And I knew that my only shot was across six lanes of highway where they had recently laid a narrow strip of grass. Everything else was cement and macadam. All I could think of as I began to run across that highway, which seemed to last forever, was my son, who I screamed to. I can't leave you now. I won't leave you now. I haven't had you long enough. I reached the grass, dropped and rolled, and at last was able to extinguish the flames. And through the all-consuming pain, and probably, I looked up and I saw the second plane hit. Bodies soon came crashing to the ground. 
I would be conscious for another five agonizing hours until slightly after 2 p.m. That afternoon, I was intubated and put into an induced coma. I knew that morning that I was not going to die at the side of that highway. That if I could make it through the flames, that if I could extinguish them, that if I could escape that war zone, if I could take that next breath, if I could learn to breathe again, to speak again, to walk again, to move my body again, that I would live in a body that was forever changed, but it would be a life that was there for the taking. It was mine. I survived because of will, because of faith, and because of love. All of us have been or will be wounded in some way, physical or psychologically. And though you may or will be touched by adversity, you can refuse to be held by it. Every morning you have the privilege to open your eyes. Every day you have a choice. Make it count. father figure to me and a mentor. I fell in love with the game of football and I started getting recruited from every college across the country. My thought process started to change. That's when I started thinking about goals and what I wanted to accomplish.